sneaking up behind you today. Yeah, that's the way it is. <laughs> right there. Right there. Thanks. Good morning, folks. Allow me to uh, ramble for five minutes, because it seems to be the rule of the day, and, uh, <laughs> and then I'll move to what I want to want to speak to you a little bit about. Um, I, I was speaking yesterday in Calgary uh, to uh, a large oil company, Suncor, and uh, I, I was telling them that, you know, I'm just finished writing this book, and, and when you're writing, and I've been writing for about four months, you get so enveloped in things, there's a great danger when you get up to speak that you'll just go all over the map. So what I've discovered is if I allow myself just five minutes at the start to say, here's the kind of things I've been thinking about or dealing with lately, uh, then it seems to work out quite well, because then I move back and, and do the actual program. And I was fooling around yesterday with a way of trying to explain to people a little bit about what I do. Uh, because I, I have a, a foot in two worlds. I've just come back from Harbin, China, in, which is sort of Mongolia, uh, Siberia. Like it's two hours north by plane uh, from Beijing. And I was at the uh, World Women's Hockey Championships. I've worked with our women's uh, Olympic hockey team uh, for the last uh, three or four years. And we we're preparing, as you know, for 2010. And we had a little setback in Harbin. We finished second to the Americans, which is unusual for us. It's uh, only the second time in 11 years. And it's probably the very best thing that could have happened to us by, by a long shot, because we were getting a little complacent, to be truthful. And uh, 2010 is much more important than Harbin. And so uh, it's really going to set us up beautifully in preparing for our centralized camp next year and, and towards uh, what we want to do in 2010, which is win the gold medal. Well. So Dabrowski said, okay, so we got nature. I think we agree, genetics play a role, and certainly nurture, how you're raised, right? When your kids are teenagers in particular, you're going, don't hang around with them. They're bad at influence, or they're bad this, or they're bad that, you see? So there's nature and nurture, but Dabrowski said, ah, ah, but you're missing something. You see, you're missing the third factor. What Dabrowski called the third factor, the role you choose to play in your own growth and development. <laughs> See? And Dabrowski wrote eloquently about the third factor. And as a result, uh, I've entitled my, my new book, Igniting the Third Factor, Coaching Beyond Nature and Nurture. And what I've done in order to get background on this is I've gone to coaches that I've known of around the world, uh, particularly in England and the United States and Canada, and I've interviewed them. And I've said, how did you develop such a strong developmental bias. Because you see, that's what the good coaches have. The good coaches have a developmental bias. They are trying to trigger that development in the other person. That's what they get really good at. And I like the term, the third factor, because it puts a handle on it for us. It helps us begin to go, what am I trying to do with this person again? Because it's easy to miss that third factor. Because if the person is particularly emotional, you, you get caught up in the personality and you don't see the emotion is based on the fact that they're not happy with the way things are right now. And actually, if you could harness that, you could turn it into something. You know? I, I, I tell the hockey players I work with constantly that beneath every emotion is the energy necessary to transform what you're going through. Under every emotion is all the energy you need to transform it. You look back to points on your life where you would look back and say, boy, that was a real difficult time. But you are where you are today because of how you dealt with that. Was it any fun in going through it? No, it wasn't. But you harnessed your own third factor. You look at Nelson Mandela, Helen Keller, Martin Luther King. You, you look at all of them. What did they do? They grabbed themselves by their own bootstraps and picked themselves up and moved beyond well beyond the nurture part, for example. Nelson Mandela came out of a prison and after 20 some years and was totally open and, and kind and understanding to those who even had imprisoned him for crying out loud. How do you do that? You do that when you have a lot of third factor. So what is it about coaching that has it emerging as the dominant management style right now? Well, three things. 
First of all, coaches have a strong developmental bias. Coaches passionately want to make other people better. It's the way they are as human beings. It's like they have a different set of eyeglasses. The ones I interviewed, it's like that's the way they look at people. They look at what is possible for this other person. They have moved past supervising anybody or managing. They're developing them. They see themselves as someone who develops people. We talked about a legacy. Become a developer of people. What a marvelous thing to do, not only for the other person, but for yourself. You want to bring a sense of purpose and meaning to your work? Start to be, start to be a developer of people. How do they do it? They do it through personal contact. Coaches get, they get the power of personal attention. I get it. I think one of the reasons that coaching is emerging as the dominant management style right now is because of the technological walls we are building between people. People are thirsting for face-to-face -face contact. The truth of the matter is, it's the only way you're ultimately going to appeal to what's inside another person. There's a man named Brian Gilbert. Brian Gilbert is director of lands and forests for the province of Nova Scotia. I've been doing a lot of work in the Nova Scotia government for the last 15 years uh, for the very reasons that were indicated uh, right up front here. You're not the only organization that is losing close to 50% of its people in the next five or six years. Linda Druxbury at Carleton University tells us that for every two people who retire in the next 15 years, there is less than one person available to replace them. That's just straight demographics. The competition for talent is going to be fierce. Nova Scotia government realized this many years ago. They know they can't compete with Alberta or the federal government in terms of what they can pay other people. So they've decided to get good at growing and developing their own leaders internally. I got back from Calgary yesterday. Calgary is at the leading edge of all of this stuff because the competition for talent there is unbelievable. Unbelievable. I was working with a company called Nexon uh, a, a little while ago. and The CEO, a man named Charlie Fisher, Nexon's a large international Canadian oil company. Um, Charlie Fisher was reporting back. He attended this two-day workshop I was doing on coaching skills, and uh, he was reporting back from his group on an exercise. And, and he walked to the window on the 22nd floor of their big tower in Calgary, and he said, you know, sometimes we think we have to scour out there to get the very best people in this room so that we can be successful. And then he turned around and he looked at the people in the room and he said, but maybe we need to spend at least as much time looking at the people we have and developing them, growing our own, making our own leaders. <laughs> and of course, caring. Caring is at the heart of really good coaching. If you don't genuinely like people, then why in tarnation would you ever take a role where you're responsible for them? <laughs> Imagine a gardener who hated plants. <laughs> Sadly, here's something we don't, we don't have to imagine. As I'm sure many of you are parents in this room, how wonderful is it as a parent when your child gets a teacher with a strong developmental bias? Someone who takes just as big an interest as you in this child and helping this child move forward? and encourages the work ethic and all of these kinds of things that you've been encouraging, what an ally. We go, thank goodness. But how devastating is it when our children get a teacher who doesn't even like children, who's used the same lesson plans for 20 years? Yeah, it's devastating. You know, we want people who care. If you don't genu genuinely like people, take early retirement. <laughs> you know? I don't know. Like, save a lot of other people a lot of daily grief. And perhaps yourself a heart attack, you know? Because caring is at the heart of really good coaching. 